Hey everybody, it's Dave Dugdale, learningvideo.com. So I thought it'd be fun to compare my four-year-old A7S to the new A7R 3 In this first test, I'm gonna be comparing sunglasses, or if somebody were to wear actual glasses in an interview. Um, as you can see, the original A7S doesn't take much before that person just fidgeting around with their glasses is gonna lose autofocus. And it's just not good because if the face detection loses autofocus, what's gonna happen, uh, especially if you're on the rule of thirds, it's gonna focus right there in the center of the frame where that light switch is. So that's not good if you're using autofocus in an interview and it loses it. But when we look at the A7R 3 you'll notice it takes a lot. I mean, the person pretty much has to mug their sunglasses in order for the face detection to stop working. In this next test, we're gonna see the A7S doesn't take much before the person playing around with their nose, scratching their nose, whatever they're doing, it's gonna lose face detection quite quickly. But when we look at the A7R 3 we can see that, again, this box around the face is very tenacious and it won't let go, which is a great thing. In this next test, I'm turning my chair to a profile on the A7S, and you can see it starts to lose the box um, going into profile, and then I turn all the way around. Um, it doesn't focus on the back of my head, it goes right to the light switch, which is in the center of the frame. But when we look at the A7R 3 it seems to hold that profile a little bit longer. When we turn around, it seems like they changed the algorithm here. It says, if a face detected, stay on that plane of focus um, until the face appears again. All right, going to the edge of the frame, it seems like the A7S loses itself a little bit quicker. Maybe there's not as many phase detection points going all the way out to the edge of the frame compared to the A7 R3, which seems to be able to go to the edge of the frame just a little bit more. Um, so if you're detecting faces all the way to the edge, the A7 R3 seems to be working better. Next up, I'm gonna put myself out of the frame. It's gonna focus on the light switch. I'm gonna bring up a my hand, which would be a closer object than the light switch, but it's off to the side. Um, as I bring it to the center, you'll see the A7 R3 grabs focus quite easily. Now when we use the A7 S and I raise my hand up and I bring it over in front of the light switch, you can see it's having an incredibly hard time um, grabbing hold of the hand, which should have enough contrast in it to detect it. But it doesn't, so we're gonna have to use something with much higher contrast, and you can see I'm using this focus chart to add a lot of contrast, and sure enough, it finally decides it wants to take hold of the, the chart. As you can see, the A7R3 has a much faster processor compared to the A7S original. All right, next up, I'm not gonna use a face anymore. I'm gonna look at two different objects. One of the things I noticed between these two cameras while studying them was that the A7S original would concentrate on area in the center of the frame, maybe about this big. But the A7R 3 had a much bigger area where it was concentrating in terms of priority for autofocus. So in this test, we've got autofocus continuous and we have focus area set to wide. In this setup, I put a high contrast sign and behind it, quite a few feet away, behind it is a almost a tennis ball object. It's not a tennis ball, but it was something I could just mount on my microphone stand. So the high contrast is in the upper left hand corner. And what I'm doing is turning the light on the tennis ball as we bring it up. And you can see it's still not latching on to the tennis ball, so I'll bring it back down. I'll move it a, maybe a foot or two over and then we're gonna bring it up. You can see it's not latching onto the tennis ball. I'll bring it down. So what we're trying to do is find out where it starts to kick in. And at this next one, you can see I'm bringing it up slowly, a little bit slowly, and about right about there, it latched onto it when it got enough light on the ball. Now watch this, this is really interesting. I brought the exposure way up so you could just see it. Um, I moved it right to the center. I have no light turned on it, absolutely nothing. And it's focusing on the tennis ball which is just amazing. And as you can see right here, there it is. When I turn the light on, it's right in the center of the frame. Now, if you didn't want on the tennis ball, we can barely see, you can press the shutter halfway down and you can lock onto that nearest object. But after a few seconds, you can see it's going back to the tennis ball, which is just amazing because the tennis ball is so dark. I can't even see it on the screen. It's amazing. So I'm gonna start at the bottom next and move our way up. You can see nothing happened there. I'll bring it up a little bit, bring the light up a little bit here, and didn't do anything, so I'll bring it up a little bit higher. Um, in fact, I just brought it up right there, and that's where we can start to see that the autofocus in the center of the frame is starting to work. Now, obviously, we didn't want to focus on the tennis ball. I could use some, one of the tools like 
center lock on, autofocus, and I could bring this up to the center of the frame. The tennis ball is still there, um, but as you can see, it's now just tracking the high contrast sign rather than the tennis ball. Or you could use something else like spot focus when you touch the screen, or you could use something like flexible spot to do the same thing. So why run all these tests? Well, I got the A7R 3 in. Um, I created a course on it, which uh, there's a link to it below. I was running a lot of autofocus tests and I was noticing that this box is very tenacious and it just did not want to let go. Uh, no matter if you're playing with glasses, if you're rubbing your nose, somebody's looking down at their notes. And I had a number of interviews coming up. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna shoot it at F1.8. The interviews in such short form that I could have the person repeat over and over again that they're the line. So it wasn't that big of a deal if uh, you lost one take. Um, and then just put them on a rule of thirds. And it was kind of gutsy too, because if you lose their face, it's gonna go to the background, which is not good, especially if you're shooting on a rule of thirds. I, now obviously, if the person was kind of centered in the frame like this, it wouldn't be as big of a risk at f1.8 because the algorithm is centered around this part of the frame right here. And it latches on like we noticed from that tennis ball example. It just doesn't want to let go in that center of the frame. But over here, it's a lot more gutsy. Now, I want to say those 10 interviews that I did worked out fantastic. There was only one instance where it lost autofocus. And again, it was a, those short form interviews where I could just say, hey, I think we could do better on the next take. That's pretty much it. So if you enjoy this type of technical information, definitely check out my course below over five hours of content, kind of just like this. Um, so definitely check it out and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.